Um, I'm really happy to announce to you Jeremy Zimmerman of uh, La Quadrature du Net, and he's going to talk about what he does best, defending our uh, freedoms online. And um, so, yeah, we're going to have a quite big of uh, Q&A session in the end of the talk, uh, but we'll yeah, do that as it plays out. So please welcome Jerry, Jeremy Zimmerman, and let's go. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for being here rather than in the NSA whistleblowers panel, which I think kicks us, by the way, and if I had a, a choice, I, I would rather be there. But uh, <laughs> uh, hi, and um, hi to everyone who will watch this video later because they're attending the NSA whistleblower panel as well. Um, I think it is important that we gather together for many reasons. Uh, it is important because it's fun, it is important because we drink chunk and listen to fantastic German electronic music, um, and it is important also because it gives us an occasion um, to discuss around our common values and to uh, have an occasion to sit down and look a bit at the past in order to be able to plan the future. So this is what I hope it will be able, uh, we will be able, sorry, to, um, to do together now. It, l looking a bit at what happened uh, these days and how we can learn from that to do more epic shit in the next month and years. So I don't know if you noticed, but quite important events appeared um, last year. Uh, basically, we won. We won against SOPA and PIPA in the US, and we won against ACTA. This is something unthinkable. This is something unbelievable. Months before that, even weeks before that, every political analyst that would be out there would tell you it is impossible to win against SOPA and PIPA, to win against Hollywood in the US, and it is impossible to win against ACTA, to win against those 39 governments teamed together to do whatever the industry asked them to do. Well, it was impossible and we did it. So this is a very important news. This is a, a great news we really have to, to think about, to, to, to dissect, to look at in a, in a very precise way. Because this is not obviously the, the, the ultimate recipe this is not by itself the action plan, but I think that what we have here with this victory is proof of concept and running code that we definitely can change things to defend our freedom online and therefore to change the world. So this is an extremely important victory. And I, I want just to do a, a quick survey here. Maybe by, by raising hands, you could tell me who among you participated in any way to raise attention against SOPA, PIPA, and ACTA, whether by blogging, by tweeting, by retweeting, by contacting your member of the parliament, by speaking about it with your relatives, just to speak about ACTA, SOPA, and PIPA. That's something like 98% of the room here. And well, all of you, you are somewhere on that map. This has been done by researchers from Sciences Po in Paris and from Goldsmith College in London. This is an issue map of ACTA. And so you, you can see the interaction, you can see the link between the various websites and entities, and you can see how diverse this victory was. It's not La Quadrature du Net, it's not Edri, it's not Kia, it's not Michael Geist who won this victory. It is the internet. The internet won against ACTA. And I think we need, to, yeah, we need to reflect a bit if there are some social science researchers among the audience who are looking for a topic uh, of research. I think this is, this is a good one. So this multitude that we are won against ACTA, but it didn't ha happen overnight. It's a very long process that we carefully designed, planned, strategized, and it's a four-year-long process. Actually, the, the first edit on the, the wiki of La Quadrature du Net about ACTA dates back from um, June the 28th, 2008, 
when the victory happened on July the 4th, 2012. That's four years of time during which we worked to achieve this victory, and we were not the first to speak about ACTA. So it is very important, I think, that we understand how we got there, what were the parameters to go there, and as hackers, we know that those parameters can be optimized and that we can do better next time. So among those parameters, and I think it is one of the most crucial ones, is analysis. We had piles of shit like this. This is one page of one leaked version of ACTA, where you can see in brackets the various positions from the various negotiating parties. This is unreadable. This is almost worse to read than the worst Perl code that is out there. <laughs> But from that, that kind of pile of shit, we did analysis. We, we peer-reviewed our analysis. Uh, as La Quadrature, we analyzed the text. We confronted this analysis with, with Michael Geist, with Kiei, with Ed Rees, with uh, every other activist that is out there. You remember that previous map. So we put our analysis out there on the wikis, and we ask everyone to come and contribute, to come and prove us wrong. We have sometimes some debates, some flame wars. Are we using that word instead of that one? Well, you know how it happens. You know, you're all subscribed on many mailing lists, I guess. So we start the, the, the it doesn't have to go to the flame wars. I mean, it, shit happens, but it doesn't have to. So um, by Having this analytical process, it takes a long time. Uh, you have to compare the various versions over time. It is also extremely interesting because when you come with some bad elements in one text and that you publish something about it, you see the next version of the text that's slightly changed, like the negotiators adapted the wording to try to dodge our analysis and try to counter our arguments, but of course it didn't work. But this is an essential part, uh, indeed, for the, the communication to the public. But more importantly, analysis is the base of everything else. Analysis is what makes us, as communities, credible when we defend our ideas. And analysis is where we take the, 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 the content that we will decline a long time to turn it into political messaging. And from this analysis of complex issues using legal uh, bits, using legal wording, we ultimately got to this. To people taking the streets, to people claiming, to people shouting that they didn't want this ACTA thing to, to go through. By the way, if, if you know her, tell her that I love her pointy hat. Um, um, but this, is, this didn't happen overnight. With the analysis, we could decline the message, uh, for instance, in, in blog posts, uh, in, in press releases, in uh, analytical notes that we circulated among the members of the European Parliament, turning that into resolutions, written declarations, etc. We, we took a few months to, to um, uh, produce and release this movie that you may have seen, as it has been seen by an overall of three million people. Uh, over the internet. The, the week we released it, it got number 52 most viewed video on YouTube for something as complex as a multilateral trade agreement about a counterfeiting and blah, blah, blah. So this is, this is something we, we're quite, prou quite proud of. But that's one part of turning this analysis into a political message. And then this political message, along with a wonderful series of events, I mean, the arrogance of our opponent was key to win this victory. Uh, the, the same week that SOPA and PIPA got defeated in the US, the, the US Gov felt uh, compelled to do something for the majors who were so furious and menacing uh, Obama of not funding his campaign again. So they just went and closed Mega Upload. Thank you. Thank you. It was so good. So good. Then we could communicate. Well, you see a world where the FBI raids mega upload? Well, with ACTA it will be worse. And that's what the US is pushing for. And it is happening right now. And so we could convert that energy from SOPA and PIPA, from mega upload, into making a point about ACTA because the analysis was there, because the political messaging was ready. And this is 
well, this and the fact that the commission and the, the, the ACTA negotiators were even more arrogant than that by next week after Mega Upload was seized, go and sign ACTA. So the signature process is something very formal. It basically means we acknowledge that this version of the text is the text we agreed upon. So it's just a symbol. But in two weeks' time frame, defeating SOPA and PIPA in the US, closing Mega Upload and signing ACTA, this is what, was, what we were talking about for these years. And all the material was ready. Everything was here to say, well, if you're upset about all this, here you go. Here is some analytical material, and here you go. And so you, you've all heard of how brilliant were the, the Polish people at mobilizing uh, their, 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 their crowds. It basically started with a Facebook message. Somebody from Kraków saying, yeah, let's, let's take the, the street. This thing is unacceptable. And there were 15,000 on day one. And so this diverse alliance of people who took the street, I mean, well, we've identified the leader of Anonymous, uh, <laughs> is hidden between a mask and cotton candy. This is what makes him so hard to trace back. And so you had children in the streets. I mean, we, 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 you had farmers in the streets because they want to be able to plant their seeds with no patents. You had HIV patients in the streets because they, they want access to medication with no uh, blockage of the, 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 the shipments. We had retro gamers, 8-bit enthusiasts who took the street with a Super Mario mask, like a Guy Fawkes mask, you know? And who published videos saying, you know this crap we do with showing video games and, and all? Maybe we cannot do this if ACTA is enacted. So this was also an extremely important part of what we had to do. And once again, when I say we, it's we the internet. It's to reach to a wider audience as possible. From the, the retro gamers to the, the, the kids uh, hidden between cotton candies to, the, the, to the, 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 the farmers, the HIV patients, and, and everybody else. This is also what took years to build. And this also takes lots of energy, lots of time to go to each and every one of them and tell them, have you heard about ACTA? Do, do you realize how bad it could be for you? Here is the analysis we have, here is the, the political messaging we have, and we think you might be interested in joining us. We, we, we did that through some uh, open letters, we did that through some informal loops of email where many people were CC'd, we did that through more formal mailing lists, we did that through informal meetings and beers around the European Parliament, and etc. And this is also what took years to achieve. And so, you know, the, which is not the end of the story, but the end of this part about ACTA. Uh, 4th of July uh, 2012, 478 against 39. This is what I call a fucking epic win. <laughs> so, have you noticed? There is one socialist here. Vital Moreira, a uh, Portuguese, uh, who is the head of the INTA committee. He was actually trying all he could to help Commissioner de Gourt to, with his strategy to postpone final vote at all costs. You would also see that the ALDE group represented here is surprisingly uh, united with a no, which is very striking as the ALDE group is usually very uh, diverse. Uh, you will notice that the EPP group, the Conservatives, are either voting against or abstaining or being French. <laughs> On the 39 pro acta, I think 21 of them, a majority of the pro acta were French, UMP from Nicolas Sarkozy's party. And, uh, and you will notice that from the far right to the far left, once again, we had people supporting us, which really means that our issues are not this stupid left versus right cleavage, which really means that our values are universal values that can reach everyone. But once again, this vote didn't happen overnight. This wasn't like, oh, people took the street, yay, we won, epic win. No, this is one, well, this is the last of seven votes that happened in the European Parliament on ACTA. And for each of them, we had to be there to decrypt the procedure, to look at what was going on, who was putting what amendments. Uh, the, the, the first of those seven votes, 
was probably the most crucial one, even more crucial than the, the final plenary one. It was when uh, the, the recently appointed rapporteur, David Martin, along with Vital Moreira, you remember this green dot here, tried to play the game of Karl de Gurt and said, oh yeah, yeah, the commission will ask the European Court of Justice if, if ACTA harms fundamental freedoms, and us, the parliament, are so concerned by citizens' fundamental freedoms that we will also ask the European Court of Justice our opinion about that. Oh, how would you oppose that? Well, <laughs> actually, we did. And it took us um, three elements. One bit from the rules of procedure of the European Court of Justice itself that said that, well, if the commission challenges the court, well, the parliament can send its written observations. A bit of the treaty for the European, uh, the TFEU, that showed that, well, if the commission asks for, well, it didn't show that is, if the commission asked for uh, this question, then uh, the, the, the parliament in any way had anything else to do by asking it its, itself. And it also showed how short the question could be. Like, is ACTA compatible with the treaties? Dot. Which means that if the parliament really wants to know and can make its observations to the court, it can send 200 pages. The format is free, you can send whatever you want. And the third one was a bit from the rules of procedure of the European Parliament itself, that showed that if the parliament asked the question to the court, then it would postpone the final vote. And this was the trick that they were trying to play against us. And it was the only reason for the parliament to ask this question to the court, was to postpone the final vote by maybe one year or two years, in which time everything will be diffused, nobody would care about ACTA anymore, there would have been an ACTA 2, 3, 4, 5, or whatever. And so this was a trick that they were playing against us, and we demonstrated crystal clear. And we said to each and every one of the members of this intercommittee, well, if you vote, like what the rapporteur asks you, it means you do not want to take care of our fundamental freedoms, that you want to postpone it, that you want to, to kick your responsibility out, and maybe out of your legislature, maybe after the elections, you know? And this is a vote that we won, 21 against 5, and this was probably the most crucial of all the ACTA votes. Then were the five others in the committees, and this is because one after the other, we helped uh, shed light on this process and its stakes. And this is because you, everybody here, participated in getting this message through. That we got this epic result in the end. It didn't come out of the blue. And actually, well, maybe it saddens, it saddened a few people here and there. Okay, that's Commissioner de Hoort, who is responsible for, was responsible for ACTA in the European Commission. Yeah? So, yeah, for, for opponents, it was a bit like, you know, one of those moments in life <laughs> <laughs> when you, you were just completely sure about something, and the next second you're, uh oh, no, maybe it's not, yeah, oh. Oh shit, that's, yeah, that's the, the oh shit feeling of Commissioner de Hoort and the few ACTA supporters that were remaining in the, in the European Parliament. And so, this is an extremely important aspect of it all, is that our opponents themselves must understand, we must look at them in the eyes and tell them, we see what you're doing here, we watch you, and now you're standing over the edge of a cliff. Huh? But let's not, um, let's not bath in too much uh, satisfaction here. Because I tell you, this is a very important victory. But this is only an important victory if we use it to look at the future and to go forward. Because our opponents didn't even wait for this vote to unravel the rest of their plan. And yes, they do have a plan. It may be a stupid plan, but it is, it is a plan. And you, 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 know, um, you know some of this, maybe? Well, okay, s somebody may be made up. Uh, I, I let you... Uh, um, but this is really a global strategy that we are facing right now. Um, you've heard of TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It was recently announced that the EU and the US 
would together engage into negotiating some kind of trade agreement, la la la. This is the, uh, nicknamed so far the TAP, the Transatlantic Partnership. And you can be sure that on day one of the negotiations, there will be an intellectual property chapter in it. There will be some enforcement. There will be exactly the same wording that are in TPP, that are very similar to the wording that was in ACTA. So all opponents will never stop, because like the coyote, they have infinite leaves. Because like the coyote, they get infinite supply of Acme goods. They have unlimited resources. So this is their plan, and we now have proof of concept and running code that we can counter it. So each and every attempt they will do to impose the same restrictive shit, we will have to be all over the internet to set the internet on fire, to use every possible bit of pixel and media and whatever centralized or decentralized service there is out there. We will have maybe to take the streets we will have to be everywhere in each and every committee of the parliament. We'll have to do this over and over again and be better and better each time at doing it. So this is something I ask you, all of you here, to think about. So this was not just a rehearsal, but that was just one episode. And there will be many others. But the good thing is that now we are in a position where we are uh, mature enough, where we may be potentially strong enough politically, come on, we beat Hollywood, we beat the US Gov, we beat the European Commission at this game. So maybe we are powerful enough to deploy our own plan, and actually we have a plan. We already also have a proof of concept and running code for that plan. For those who cannot read that, it means sharing will save the world. And this was put like this on this statue somewhere in Paris during some protest, I think it's beautiful. So we have proof of concept and running code. It is called a free internet, and it still vaguely exists in some parts of the world, including ours. And it is a huge machine for sharing that makes this world a better place. We know that, you, everybody, it's obvious to say that here, but we have this machine still between our hands. And we know that sharing makes things go better because we have Wikipedia, because we have GNU and free software, because we have BitTorrent, and it just works. But more importantly, we are today engaging in some cultural activities that are based on sharing and remixing of the works. It is not uh, an ID, it is not a concept. This is our culture today. And I, I, I engage uh, uh, you, I, I invite you to go to countries in Latin America. To, I haven't been to, to Mexico but read so much about it, and I've, I've been to, to Brazil and saw that. Those new musical movements like Techno Brega, like Baile Funk, like those Sonideros, on every street corner, they just take, reuse, remix, and share. And that's the way culture is going on and is so vibrant around there. This is what we do, this is what exists today. So when our culture is here and when the law is going in that direction, it's not by making the law go further in that direction that we'll get anywhere. And it's not by trying to make culture go in the same direction as the law, because it won't work. So, here is the plan. The plan is to try to make law come again on the same track as what a culture is, of what a world is, or what a technology is today. And so this is <laughs> much easier to say than to do, obviously. And this is probably a, more, a much more difficult task than even to beat ACTA. And oh boy, this was difficult. But come on, we're hackers after all. We know how to do difficult things. We know how to do things that for people are just like black magic, right? So here we go, and this is the, the exercise I, I offer to your um, intelligence here. Let's do it. 
Let's make a plan. Let's do the analysis. Let's share and cross and, and peer to peer this analysis. Let's get to the widest coalition possible. Let's turn all this into some political messaging. Let's flood the fucking internet with it. And in the end, proof of concept, running code. In the end, we win. So, how do we do that? Well, we tried modestly, as La Quadrature du Net, to formulate for some times our proposals. So each time we were opposing some piece of crap legislation, at the same time we were building a proposition. It's, well, that's the way we, we used to think, you know, we're, we're hackers, we're builders, therefore we have to, yeah, we have to build things. And also it very much fits the way uh, politicians and journalists interact with us. Oh yeah, you're against this three strikes law, but what do you propose? Eh? Well, what do we propose? Okay, take a look at this. You, here you have a book, here you have the 30 pages, this and this and that. Oh, shit, they're serious. Huh. So, we've been building proposals a long time and we've um, put them in one and same place. Uh, you have the URL here and a very um, trendy QR code here. You may want to, to flash with your, your device. And um, we put that out there like the rest and we call people to, to comment, to oppose, to troll. And so this is the, the, the basic um, um, structure of it. It's about defending the human rights in the digital society. It's about protecting a free and open infrastructure. And it is about uh, maximizing the um, sharing of knowledge. So those are the angles. And I invite you to, to read into the details. More recently, we came up with those uh, 14 elements of proposals for reforming copyright and associated cultural policies. Here again, a very long URL, I'm sorry and a QR code here. Um, those were detailed by Philippe Egrin and uh, other thinkers of, of copyright and, and cultural policies. And uh, again, are open for, for comment. Well, you will, you will see that it starts with giving legal recognition to the non-market sharing of digital works between individuals through the exhaustion of rights doctrine. So this is indeed complex, complex wording close to, to legalese. And this is the kind of things that would very much be turned into strong political message. It's about non-market sharing between individuals. If it's you and me, and if it's a peer-to-peer -peer connection, and if we, there's no money involved, then there is no reason it should be enforced in the first place. Problem solved. And this is among the things we have to, to explain. So we could discuss that in, in great length. It could take hours. And we actually planned a workshop that can take as long as we want. Uh, I think it's on day two or three or whatever. Look at the, the wiki. Uh, come by your, our space in the, the Hack Center. And we will discuss about the, those proposals for reforming copyright. Uh, more importantly, because this is all about the theory. You remember I told you about the, the, the long and boring analytical part that came before any form of, of victory. Well, it would be totally legitimate for some of you not to want to take part in this uh, piece of uh, analysis. I would, I mean, I would really understand that. Uh, the, it's not that I like the legalese myself. It's really, well, so, some has to, to do it. But also we, we reproduce, and I think this is even more um, Im important, uh, we produce an action plan we produced an action plan with uh, some, some people from Poland who were part of organizing this, this wonderful movement, people from the, the Modern Poland F Foundation. Uh, we, um, dis uh, we discussed this plan and we, we, we wrote this, this plan with people from Comunia, uh, defending the public domain, from the, the people of the Free Culture Forum in Barcelona, that, that is already several uh, organizations around, and I, I pro some researchers, and I, I forget some. Um, it is a 12 point plan. It is as short as possible. I think it fits in three uh, A4 uh, pages. And it is currently on that URL on a collaborative platform called Comment, where you can just select a piece of text and make a comment on it. It is far from being perfect. It is a very, very rough first draft. The English is not even quite good. But it would be extremely helpful if you could note down this URL and when you find some time, go there and help us by commenting those actions that we plan as being the way to go to change copyright for good, to stop this copyright madness, to stop this trend of using copyright enforcement as, as a pretext to program into the very core of the network rules that amount to censorship. 
to program the very same equipments that are used in authoritarian regime for political censorship and turn them into copyright enforcement machine. We have to stop this trend. And this is modestly, I'm not saying this is the plan or the master plan. This is one plan of action. And when you will have commented it, when we will have integrated the comment and produced another version and maybe commented on the second version, I told you this is a long process. Then we can go to each and every one, to every organization there is around and ask them, do you, do you agree? Do you think this is the plan? Do you think we could go for it now? And then we can start to get things started. So this is one, one way of acting. This is the, the analytical part of it. And then indeed is the, um, is the, the, the way we put this in, in form, we put this into, into action. And this is also where we have to invent and where we have every day to invent new forms of actions and new ways of actions. I mean, making videos on, on the, the centralized platforms uh, is one way. Um, putting people in the streets is another way. Um, m making a flyer and having it translated is, is another way. But the most important means of action are probably the ones we didn't invent yet. So this is also a very important part of the reflection. And if you yourself are not very much into the analytical part of it, maybe you're a bit into this, this part of action, creative strategy for, for making things go forward. As an example, this is one thing we, we did recently. This is the, the data of USB key. We, um, do I have one with me? Oh, yeah, I should have one with me. Uh, we, we successfully crowdfunded this. Uh, to produce more than 1,000 of them. We rose something like um, 10,000 euros. Yeah, here it is. <laughs> well, it's... <laughs> well, it's cheap Chinese crap, but it has a, a data love symbol on it. It is uh, 8 gigs, and uh, 4 gigs out of it are filled with books, with movies, and with music that all together call for reforming copyright. You have great albums from Girl Talk, which on the very first 10 seconds you, you, you hear them, you understand, oh my god, this is bits of the Rolling Stones and Madonna and this and that and my hips are moving in all directions. <laughs> oh, is this the way culture is being made today? Uh-huh. Then go for the books of Cory Doctorow and Philippe Grin and Lessig and Benkler and all. And then you can watch Reap a Remix Manifesto or such things that are also included on the key. And the point was to distribute 753 of them to each and every member of the European Parliament, which we did successfully through this collective effort of crowdfunding and with the help of volunteers who spent days in the hell of the European Parliament, who knocked each and every door. Can you imagine how difficult and painful this can be? And actually, we were extremely surprised of how well received we were in the offices of the members. Of course, we started with the, the, the nice hippie tree hugger green people because we knew already that they would be quite open to what we have to say to them. Then we gradually went to the, the socialists who unanimously, but Vital Moreira voted against ACTA, you know, and so the, the discourse went uh, sharper and sharper, like, oh, you remember ACTA? Well, this is the after ACTA, blah, blah, blah. And, but the, 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 the major amazement was to see that even the liberals and even some conservatives were open to our message. They were surprised by the fact that we were not coming to their office to shout for a thousand times, no to whatever thing you're about to vote, but just to give them something. Yeah, we are from the internet and we, we give you this, you know, <laughs> come, yeah, keep it, yeah. That's, yeah, we can do this, you know, we're the internet. <laughs> and um, some assistants run after the, the, the volunteers and say, hey, can we have one for ourselves? I think that most of the others just kept them for themselves. But this is good also because the, the assistants are, are, are key in those debates. And very often by the discussions with their members, they are the ones shaping the, 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 the positions and the policy, except when there is an unbreakable group position. But then we're here to try to break the group position. And uh, some, uh, some assistants were also running after us or just finding us again in the corridor saying, hey, we, we looked at it, we listened at it, that's cool, thank you, man. And so uh, this is uh, quite simple. I mean, 10,000 euros uh, through 250 people who contributed. It's not much. I mean, compared to how much we love the internet. Uh, 
come on, that's not much compared to what costs a lobby firm, a lawyer firm doing lobbying. I mean, that's probably the cost of half a day of a note on Hill or those philanthropists, people. Um, so we did this. That's one idea. That's one way to, to set a foot in the door uh, in the, the offices to try to start a discussion with them. It was also an occasion to, to start mapping who was receptive got a little plus on our paper, who was hostile got a little minus, and this will help us to further d develop a strategy there. So, um, <clears throat> as Nina Paley puts it, We could wait forever. I mean, we could attempt forever to change copyright law, but anyway, it is worth attempting. But I, I really like Nina Paley, that's mostly why I, I put this one here. But um, no, w what it means is that what I'm presenting here is not the master plan. I may be wrong. Please question, question what I'm saying to you. And whatever we do, whatever epic shit, whatever fantastic victory, we get on this issue shouldn't stop us from continuing with each and every possible mean of action we have, which is making art, which is continuing to do the most incredible mashups like G Girl Talk has been doing for years, which is mixing those pop standards with crazy tropical beats like the people in Brazil do with Technobrega, which means doing code which means inventing new protocols that would root around the censorship and all this. And this is once again this multitude that we are through this open and decentralized and free internet. This is our th strength and this is what should at all costs be uh, nourished, be mm, uh, maintained, be uh, stimulated to achieve our results. So political action in the parliament is one thing, but it's all the things together that are the key to doing epic shit and making this world a better place. So this was the proof of concept and the running code for one case, which is defeating ACTA, then reforming copyright. And we'll talk about this again in six months, in one year, in three years, in five years, Honestly, I don't expect anything to change, at least before the end of this legislature, which is 2014. Middle of 2014 are the new uh, European Parliament elections and the appointment of the new commission. So this is a very long-term strategy. But what we have to keep in mind is that these copyright issues are just one part of the problem. And all the, the parts, all the ones I mapped here and others are interlocked together. Copyright means breaches to net neutrality when we program the routers to determine which legal content should go through. Net neutrality is related to censorship when an operator decides what is going through or not through the network. Censorship is indeed related to surveillance when we have to watch the communication to get to know which goes through. And surveillance is indeed related to what's happening here. Is that me? Censorship. Censorship. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, oh, yeah, mic neutrality. <laughs> and surveillance is now indeed deeply linked to copyright when those private companies are monitoring the network, are monitoring what we do online in the name of the, the, the so-called enforcement. But what you have in the middle of it is the most important part. What you have in the middle of this are our fundamental freedoms. It's our freedom of expression. It's our freedom of communication. It's our privacy. It's a right to a fair trial. It's a freedom of assembly. And all this is at the middle of these issues, of this dossier we have to work on, of this multitude of attacks that we will have to counter by doing epic shit in the European Parliament and elsewhere. And all this requires a positive agenda that we will push. So this is a very, very difficult job but I hope that you all understand that we have to do it. And show to the world, whenever somebody tells you, nah, there's nothing we can do about it anyway, that's not my department. <laughs> you can tell them, look at what we did with ACTA 
And now let's start working. I thank you very much. So I hope you will troll, I hope you will comment, I hope you'll have questions. There are microphones here, so if you could queue in, in front of them, I think that's the most uh, balanced way of um, um, mitigating or load balancing the, the, the questions. Uh, we'll do w one of each microphone. Um, are, are you standing? To, to, okay, so okay, that's one, one queue, that's even better. Now, uh, um, excuse me, here, there, are you queuing for a question as well? Okay, so, y y uh, oh, okay, good. Uh, Michel? Oh, hi. Um, uh, hi, Jeremy, nice to see you again. Uh, two things. Uh, first, uh, to, you know, put, you know, draw the line a little bit further from what you've said. Uh, just think about, uh, just could any, anybody here think about what would happen if a person, if an MEP walked into the, you know, European Parliament, uh, stand or whatever and started uh, started uh, calling for um, for removing women's right to vote can you imagine that uh, uh, just wait for because the, here's the kicker uh, he would be probably just you know laughed out of the building because it's so absurd and this is the point that uh, this is the point where we have to get the copyright debate that we don't have to change the law, actually. This is exactly what you've been talking about all the time. We need to make it so that every single MEP, whether he likes it or not, knows that if he, uh, if he proposes more copyright you know, surveillance or whatever, he will be laughed out of the building. This is what we have to achieve so that we can actually win. And this is the epic shit that has to, I mean, this is what the epic shit has to uh, achieve. And the second uh, thing about the epic shit, there is an epic uh, website in Poland called Strata Kazika, which means Kazik's loss. Can you spell it? Uh, S-T-R-A-T-A-K-A-Z-I-K-A dot oh. P-L. Do you have a QR code for it? Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so anyway, the idea is simple yet brilliant. At some point, Kazik, Kazik is a well-known singer in Poland, and at some point, one of his, uh, his CDs got really, really badly pirated. Oh. Uh, and he said something like, oh, those internet uh, users are basically, you know, pirates or whatever. And uh, a guy just said, okay, let's start counting the losses. He set up a server, he set up a website, and in the background on this server, the CD is being copied and deleted, copied and deleted, copied and deleted <laughs> all the time, over and over again. And each copy and deletion is counted and multiplied by the price of the CD. And this uh, amount Brilliant. is being shown on the website. Brilliant. So Kajik apparently oh, lost no. like 186 million lotus already oh, no. because a CD is being copied and deleted on the server. Because see, obviously each copy is obviously. a lost sale, right? Oh. Fuck! <laughs> it doesn't right, wait, well, It doesn't work like that. And the best thing that this guy—he's uh, called Radek, and he's from Modern Poland uh, Foundation. Also, uh, uh, the awesome thing that uh, this guy said on the recent copyright debate uh, thing is that I'm actually waiting until this—you know—this amount surpasses the uh, the uh, the net. Um, what's the English name? Uh, GDP. Earth, net, net, net GDP, no? GDP, uh -huh. yeah, Earth GDP. Okay. This will be the interesting point. Oh, yeah, the, you know. the tipping point. Yeah, Very exactly. good. Thanks. Very good. Well, it's, it's a fantastic example of how code can help convey a political message. And about the, the first part of your intervention is making the people who push those crazy lobby driven, uh, repressive, and damaging legislation to expose them is also extremely important because in the end we, we, we increase the political cost of taking those bad decisions. And this is also something you can do with code. And you can do this with um, some bit of code called political memory. That is uh, a website that we developed along the years that is a wonderful um, Django application. You can come to a workshop about it on La Quadrature du Net's um, assembly later on. We basically scores, scored the members of the European Parliament according to their votes. 
So uh, you see over time who are the, the good ones, who are the bad ones, who, are, who is improving, who is deproving. Um, and you can, for instance, go there and watch the 39 who voted in favor of ACTA and send them an email like, oh, I saw on this website that you voted in favor of ACTA. I don't like you. <laughs> and those, this is about making code that leaves traces on the internet that makes a point and that, that shows to these people that if they continue to do what they're doing, well, we, we, there will be election that sometimes. Thank you for your comments. <coughs> yes, please. Hi, Ville uh, Oksanen from Electronic Frontier Finland. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, in Finland, a uh, couple of uh, months ago, a uh, nine-year-old uh, girl got uh, prided by the Finnish police because um, he was sharing one CD in Pirate Bay uh, by accident. And uh, anyway, that launched in uh, Finland a uh, quite interesting response. And uh, now we are going to see in uh, 20 days um, citizen initiative, which is something totally new in Finland. Um, uh, we recently changed our constitution, but uh, normal citizens can propose a real law to parliament mm. if uh, 50,000 people signs that uh, mm. secular signature. And, um, we are actually trying to push uh, pretty much uh, similar package uh, what you have listed here. It's not uh, exactly as far-reaching what you are proposing because uh, the EU directive makes it impossible to uh, basically to have that kind of uh, legislation. And uh, uh, here comes actually my question. Uh, even if we wanted to change the directives in EU and uh, have a political power to do it, it wouldn't be possible because uh, there's another layer of uh, regulation which comes from uh, uh, World Intellectual Property Rights Organization, which is spinning for European Union. So how do you see that we can get uh, this uh, discussion to the global level so that we can uh, change the, also the Bern Convention and the <laughs> Convention, which require that everybody, including the United States, mm -hmm. agrees on those changes? Well, uh, about the, the Bern Convention, one thing comes to my mind is burn, baby, burn. Uh, but no, it's not, yep. it's not a serious answer. Um, I think that we should start with, uh, no, I wouldn't even call that a modest objective, because already changing EU legislation copyright is a f fucking ginormous objective. But this is a first step, and this is something that is, well, let's say, it's our department, you know? We're EU citizens, therefore we are represented by those people in the European Parliament. Uh, they can force the Commission to make a proposal and then amend the proposal, and this is how we get things through. For the Berne Convention, well, it would have to be a, a, a next step, maybe. But uh, I think that what our opponents use the most against us and against our argument that uh, sharing between individuals not for profit should be made legal or should be stopped from being uh, enforced is that, oh yeah, but those TRIPS agreements, there is the three steps test. It's part of the TRIPS agreement, so it's part of the WTO. And it says basically that one exception to copyright should not go against the normal exploitation of the works. Well, therefore, sh sharing cannot be legal. Well, it's a matter of interpretation. I think that sharing of works is part of the normal interpretation of a work, because when it is good, it is shared. And this is exactly what said Hervé Le Chapelier, who was in France the first rapporteur on the first authored law in 1791. And he said, it is a very peculiar kind of property because when the works are good, the public makes them his property, its property. So I think we have to go step by step. And the most important is we have to build a political message that will make it inevitable. <coughs> and then the, the, the rest will be mere technicality, I hope. <laughs> <clears throat> and a uh, little bit uh, further on that one, uh, I guess uh, most of the people here haven't heard, for example, uh, so-called uh, uh, VIP treaty or visually impaired people's treaty, oh. which has been uh, discussed in uh, WIPO. And uh, for example, European Union uh, basically opposed it, uh, which yep. means that the European Union doesn't want to give yep. uh, uh, books for pl blind people in developing countries. So this, this and, usually... Uh, it's happening even today, even if... Uh, and 
even uh, European oh. Parliament has uh, signed a couple of resolutions to support uh, yeah. this treaty, but nothing happens but inside WIPO. Oh, 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 well, my friend, I, I agree. So here's something that... Uh, I, I agree yeah. that this is a very important tactical step to say in WIPO that has been so mm, Taliban about copyright for the last years that we should reopen one exception is a very important thing to make. Mm. But what you see is that one week ago, was announced that they will be open a diplomatic uh, convention about it to discuss it. So this is a major victory. I'm not saying that the, the treaty is here, but compared to where we, we stood three, three years ago, mm. it's major progress. And it shows that there are activists on all sides, people from uh, Knowledge Ecology International and TACD and many others too. who are <laughs> right now going to WIPO, going uh, in, um, in Switzerland where the, where the meetings are happening, to to watch this, to negotiate with the people. They're bringing blind people who tell them, hey, we want the right to read, and they're getting results. So mm. I think it's an encouraging sign. And uh, well, uh, just a uh, reason why I pointed out this was there is, very no, very is sorry, sorry, there's no that. European voice there at the moment. That's a problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The France and the UK were among the, the worst opponents to this, this treaty, and so we have to work also on national level. Mm. Uh, first, I want to thank you for your, for your big uh, success of your work. I have been in Austria and I, we were at the ACTA demos and we are, I'm very happy as well that we did it. Where, where um, are you from? I'm from Austria. So we had people from uh, Poland, uh, Finland, mm. uh, Austria, we have Belgian people, I come mm. from France, I mean we are the internet, and yeah. they're beautiful. <laughs> it was fucking cold in January, but it worked, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And I think one of the big topics in, on, in the future will be to bring the, uh, the artists on our side. The artist has, has to recognize that the big media companies are stealing the money from them. They are keeping the money from the consumers and don't giving it to them. And they have to recognize that they don't need the media companies for making their marketing anymore because the internet is here. They can do it at their own. They can reach their own consumers more directly, more precisely on, without these media companies. And they should degrade these companies to producing factories for their cities. I agree. I, I agree with this objective, but I'm afraid it's much more complicated than it sounds. Mm. We've been, uh, not, not, we've been uh, attempting that since the last 10 years. Mm. And I go as far as the previous re revision of uh, copyright law in France, the DIDVSI. And I mean, we, we as communities have been attempting that for a long time. You have, for once, the, the pressure of those intermediaries who are the, the, the king makers still in some parts of the, the, the areas of, of culture. But you also have to face the collecting societies who speak in the names of, of the artists and who are extremely powerful and who are, they are paying artists some substantive amount, not all of them, but the, the ones who are visible. Some of them are uh, half of their rent paid by a collecting society, which is more than enough to block them from saying anything against them. So, I agree, this is a, a strategic objective. But we have to get them on our this side. Is, yes. I think this is maybe the, the turning artists. point of the mm. debate, that the day the artists will be here, it mm -hmm. means we will have won, but maybe there are steps in the between, mm -hmm. which mean building this political momentum, and also maybe aiming for uh, easier populations to get on board. The, the farmers with the seeds and the patents, are already somewhere there. The researchers with access to scientific publications and those editors who are ripping everybody off, which is something completely outrageous. Researchers are now revolting against the editors. Mm -hmm. So researchers will, will come on board. And I think that this is little by little by adding mm -hmm. communities in, in the, the bandwagon that ultimately we will get to the artist, and but we, we're not there yet. And, and one... one yeah. <laughs> and, and one idea, uh, let's be more demanding. Let's say everything which is older than 30 years is public domain. There is no patent on scientific uh, uh, ten, <laughs> 20, okay? There is no, no, no patent on scientific discoveries, no patent on design, colors, 
the sky or bi biologic uh, facts, yes? And, and let's, let's pay the companies for using our public environment to bring uh, us their media. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but mm -hmm. as, as there are four minutes left and three okay. questions, come and discuss okay. that to the, the copyright workshop we'll do. Come and comment the action plan. We, we have to spend time to discuss about all these issues, but I, I'm, I, f I fully agree. I fully agree. Daniel. Oh, hi. <laughs> I have two little quick questions. So the first one is obviously uh, you said the people behind ICTAS, uh, PIPA, and uh, etc. Uh, <laughs> will repeat uh, that process and will uh, do that shit again. So we have to defend ourselves again. So obviously uh, their doings have huge uh, financial costs, but our defense uh, has also a um, uh, huge uh, energy cost. So my question is, uh, what tools uh, are built or can we build uh, to make it easier for citizens to repeat that process and to make sure that uh, they will get tired before we get tired? Well, um, to, to, to make um, a long answer short, first of all, we need new blood. Young assholes like you. Well, Thanks. <laughs> 10 years younger than me, and who will do this kind of things again when I'll be retired or dead, whichever comes first. So, uh, first of all, uh, the, the, the people who are younger than us have no reason not to be part of it. Uh, then, uh, one part of the answer uh, would be the Python, and there is a workshop about it on the assembly of La Quadrature du Net one of these days. It's, once again, we put some bits of code and some bits of technology together. Uh, it's a voice over IP uh, front end which allow us to make a campaign and target some members of some committee, some people in the European Parliament. We remove the tree-hugging Greens because they agree already. We remove those nice liberals because they agree with us. This evil um, uh, conservative, we put extra weight on her because she's Marielle Gallo. A and then users come and they have one MEP that is randomly proposed to them and they click call now and they have the voice over IP software uh, triggering the, the call or they enter their phone number and are being called by us and hear a voice, you will be c connected with a member of the European Parliament, press star. And so we do the two calls, we connect them together, so nobody, well, the, the, the users don't have to pay. So somebody who is far away, who would call Brussels with his or her mobile, which would be costly, can now think, oh, maybe I can do it if it's free. So we have the, the technology and we can invent the codes to make those things easier. Let's, let's get started. I also heard about uh, political memory 2.0 and it looks uh, fucking awesome. So oh yes, it is. If people want to, to get involved. Uh, second, uh, very short question. Uh, so uh, how far are we from uh, laws that we don't have to fight, but we can support? So how, lo how long uh, until uh, positive laws? Are? I, I cannot tell. One, one thing I know for sure is that our chances of success are directly proportionate to the energy we invest. So the answer to your and question... And the efficiency of our tools, huh? so... Yeah, so the, the, the answer to your question is, it depends on how hard we will work on it fr from now on. Why not call for the complete abolition of copyright <laughs> rather than its mere reform? First, with public funding distributed by popular vote or use statistics to fund the creators of the works involved. Uh, that's a good question. Actually, I had discussed that in great length with Nina Paley, quoted earlier, who is very radical about it. Um, that's another strategy. Nothing forbids it from being attempted at the same time as ours. I don't think it's the best one because I think some elements of copyright can be useful, like for instance, the defense of moral rights and attribution rights. But this can be discussed. Please come to the, the workshop and let's exchange views uh, on that. And by defending this in the European Parliament, you would be the bad cop and we would be the good cop. I mean, this would, this would be very comfortable for us as we usually are the, the bad cop, you know? One final question, I understand. Jeremy, I have a follow-on question, question to the question of our Finnish friends. Uh, it's kind of frustrating indeed that many of these laws are entrenched in, in, in WIPO and Berne Convention and, and so on, and uh, mm. World Trade Agreement. But now there uh, are scratches in the, on the surface because the BRICS countries like Brazil, Brazil and China, they are um, well, ex exercising their power. 
do you have any connection with, with, with people from these countries? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, we, we are, you know, we are the internet, so indeed we are connected. The, the, the Chinese is, is the most difficult. Uh, we don't have contact there, and I mean, uh, if it's not a democratic country, it's very difficult to, to get anything done, I think. But we have great contact with the formidable people of the Cen Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore, in India. There are the, the people from the Fundacion uh, Getulio Vargas in, in Portugal, uh, in, in Portugal, sorry, in Brazil, who, who, who are doing an incredible job and who in the next month will have a proposal for the reform of copyright go through their parliament and that precisely call for many of our objectives already. So Brazil is in advance on very same agenda as, as ours. And indeed there is this, uh, what social science researchers call the, the boomerang effect, that something happening in one country is then picked up in another country and the picking up of it in another country comes back at the original country. Oh, look what they're saying about what we do. And so this is something we can do through a free, open, decentralized and universal internet. Because let's face it, our opponents are globalized. Their influence go beyond the influence of countries. So maybe through a free, open and universal internet, we can be uh, face to face with that. And in the end, we win. You know, the, yeah. Thank you. Oh, uh, we have time. Yeah, the angel is on the phone, so we have time okay. for one more question. Um, no? I, no? I also like to say thanks for your activism uh, concerning ACTA, for the early activism. Uh, I really enjoyed the pictures of uh, your first uh, protest at the, uh, I think it was the Zurich Lake with the pedalos. I really enjoyed it. Um, but my question is um, not quite our department. I wanted to ask about Adobe. Uh, you have a large, um, a large section on your website about Adobe in France, and I always wondered why don't we hear anything about uh, the French people protesting it? What, what is the, the... Because it's dead in the water. We said it okay. on day one, it was enacted after the Constitutional uh, Court said that Internet access was freedom of speech, period. So it is dead in the water, there was no cutoff from the internet, there won't be any. It will be turned into something else because uh, the government of François Hollande is mostly doing the same as what Nicolas Sarkozy did. Let's talk about it later. It's unimportant, it's a thing from the past. Now let's look on the, on the future. Okay. Okay. Um. okay, thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, I think you'll stick around and maybe answer some questions left. Sure. Come okay. to our assembly, get me, buy me a drink, and we'll continue the conversation. <laughs>